our next podcast is going to go into plant nutrition and transport. So we just completed um, our um, topics on um, plant reproduction and growth. We looked at the different tissue types, uh, the different parts of the plant body. And uh, now we're going to look at plant nutrition, just like we looked at um, <clears throat> the uh, digestive system and nutrition in animals. Plants also uh, need certain nutrients uh, are required for an optimal diet for plants to have um, growth occur. In our outline, we start by um, looking at how they transport this stuff. So the title of the uh, um, lecture here is Plant Nutrition and Transport. So just like we have a digestive system that we um, uh, absorb nutrients out of uh, what we intake in our diet. Plants have to get nutrients uh, and then transport those uh, around the body, but they don't have a digestive system. Um, so they have another mechanism or way to get nutrients, say, from their root system up to the top of the plant, and um, that's called tension cohesion. So we're going to start by looking at that. Now the uh, book opens up with this chapter about using that process uh, to um, as a means of cleaning up uh, environmental pollutants. So it starts here by talking about cleaning up um, poisons that are uh, in a polluted area. And they use plants to do this and their process of tension cohesion. And the way they do this is uh, if you, say, have some polluted soils, uh, you can plant certain plants in those soils they will absorb water and nutrients out of those soils, but they'll also absorb the pollutants. In this case, they're talking about arsenic. They will absorb that arsenic out of the soil uh, and then incorporate it into their tissues. And then they can be disposed of properly, um, taken away at that point. Um, so these ferns, so it talks about these ferns and the use of that. That, that process is called bioremediation. Um, there's a lot of other instances where environmentalists will use living things to help clean up an area. So bioremediation, or if it's specifically plants that are being used, it's called phytoremediation. Um, biologists use bacteria, often will be used to clean up uh, oil spills and, and things like that. So, but this is uh, phytoremediation and they're using the uh, tension cohesion of the plant. Here's another example of these sunflowers here that are absorbing um, some of this polluted water and um, uh, working on filtering that water to make it clean. Um, but so again, the plant has to get these things from down here in its root system. It can intake some of its things through uh, tissues above ground, but most of its nutrients and minerals uh, and water are going to come from the root system. But they got to get it from down here to up here. Now they have um, the way they do that. They got to go against gravity, basically, and they don't have muscle system or a pump. Um, so the way they do this is a process called tension cohesion. Tension cohesion is when the plant, in this case, this tree here, is losing water through the openings on the leaf. The leaves have these tiny openings called stomates, singular stoma, and um, they uh, water can be lost right there. It can um, basically uh, transpire, evaporate out of the leaf and then out of the plant. When it does that, when the, when the plant loses one water molecule and the rate at which these things transpire vary based on environmental factors. We mentioned some of these in the outline like um, temperature, wind, um, the humidity, all these things uh, will affect the rate of transpiration. But when it loses one water molecule, it pulls or causes a suction. You could think about it like uh, causes a suction and pulls a chain of water molecules that run through the leaf, down through the stem, down into the root. 
Here is the chain of water molecules held together by hydrogen bonds. If you remember that back from uh, Bio 1, um, we studied the, the water molecule and how they're very cohesive and adhesive. And that's very important in this um, uh, trait right here, that they stick together readily, and they also stick to the walls of these um, cells here, these xylem cells. This is part of the vascular tissue. So that vascular tissue runs through the leaf, through the stems, and then down through the roots where it can um, suck in or try to pull in another water molecule. So every one water molecule that's lost, the plant will attempt to draw in one more water molecule. All right, so that's how the plant, that whole process there is called uh, tension cohesion, and then so that's transpiration. Uh, now here's the openings. In the leaf, there are these openings. <clears throat> the openings are guarded on each side by these little cells called guard cells, and the uh, stoma or stomates uh, is the opening. These guard cells change size and they can open and close, and they do this on a, on regular uh, rhythms, patterns. All right, so, <clears throat> um, so when the water is lost uh, in the plant, when it loses it in a vapor form, we call that transpiration. So the plant's kind of always losing water molecules uh, it generally, I mean, depending on the, again, those environmental factors, but it, when it loses it in vapor form, we call that transpiration. But when the plant loses it in a liquid state, we call that gutation. All right, so an example of gutation you'd be familiar with would be dew. When the environmental conditions change from night to day, the water that's in the plant will often um, be lost in a liquid state. And uh, again, that's, we call that gutation. Okay, so that's how the plant gets its water and nutrients up into it. Now we want to look at the uh, nutrients that are in that water that the plant has to have in order uh, to have optimal growth. All right, and there's really about 17 of these, um, 17 or 16, there's one that's sometimes included, one sometimes not. I list 16 in our outline here. Your book lists this uh, extra one, uh, nickel, <clears throat> but there's a total of 16 or 17, and they're divided into two groups. The two groups they're divided into are the macronutrients and the micronutrients. These are distinguished by uh, whether they need these in large quantities or small quantities. So macronutrient, the plant needs a lot of these. Micronutrients, not so much, but they still need it for optimal diet. All right, so I list these out in the outline, and you do need to know these. So the macronutrients um, we list out there are carbon, hydrogen, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, sulfur, phosphorus. Uh, and those are the most of the plant's weight right there, uh, but also potassium, calcium, and manganese. All right, so these are uh, the um, nine macronutrients. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Nine macronutrients. All right, so the micronutrients, now the plant needs these, but in smaller quantities. And the, and the seven micronutrients, or eight um, if you include nickel, are chlorine, iron, manganese, boron, zinc, copper, nickel, and molybdenum. Now, nickel is the one I don't list, and sometimes it's listed. Um, some plants need it, some don't, but it, it it's only needed in very small quantities. But so it is a micronutrient. So, um, so those are our micronutrients, and that is uh, what the plant needs for optimal growth. If it if it's missing any of that, then it will have some type of of um, uh, stunting of the growth. And here's an example of two solutions with this plant. This plant has all 17 of those micronutrients in it. And this one has all but one. It is missing potassium. And you can see just by missing one of those, that's a macronutrient that the plant has a stunted growth and um, has some deficiencies with it. And farmers and agriculturalists uh, will often diagnose plants um, like this and they'll 
let's see, let me get that out of here. Oh, sorry about that. Uh, and they will have different types of condition, yellowing, wilting, these kind of things can often indicate which deficiency um, they need. And farmers are, uh, can then um, add a supplement to the uh, soil to uh, get that nutrient in there. Now, the next thing we mentioned in the outline is, um, let's see. Uh, well, we, we mentioned here, about the soils and most of those nutrients are found up here near the top and so we have these layers of soil we have basically an a b and c that's horizons or soil so a is up near the top call that topsoil and then uh, b is kind of that that middle layer and um, it's has a lot of the a lot of dissolved nutrients in it uh, but the topsoil is um, uh, has a many of our uh, soil organisms and things like that would be found in there and a lot of the most of the nutrients and then our C is the rock derivative kind of the parent material not many nutrients are found down in there all right so uh, next in outline we mentioned about structures that uh, assist plants with nutrition and there's a lot of different kind of we talk about um, buds and, and bulbs and these things can help protect the tissue and store some of these nutrients for the plant. So there's different types of, of structures that help the plant in either in protection or in nutrition. Um, and then there's some plants that have unique types of symbiotic relationships with um, with other plants. So plant nutrition and symbiosis. Symbiosis is when there's two organisms that live real close to each other and they provide um, um, a benefit. Um, or they, one's benefited and one's harmed. Sometimes they're both benefited, but symbiosis just means close. So they, they live together very closely. One example of that is a fungus and um, vascular plants. This is a fungal um, hyphal structure here that's around the root of a plant and uh, it's actually benefiting that root. You might think well you don't want a fungus growing on your plant. Uh, in most cases you don't but in this case this particular type of fungus actually increases the surface area for absorbing water and nutrients. So this is on the roots of these plants they can draw in more uh, nutrients and water into themselves. So it's a beneficial relationship. Other types of um, um, symbiotic relationships would be like with bacteria. Here's an example of some roots where we have these little nodules, those little knot looking things right here, bacteria live in, and they help to break down nitrogen that's not readily available to the plant, the bacteria do right here. So that's a, a beneficial relationship uh, between bacteria and a type of plants. All right, uh, and then we also can look at the um, these uh, close relationships can um, be either parasitic, <coughs> epiphytic, or carnivorous. Parasites, of course, you're gonna have one that's benefited and one that's harmed. Uh, epiphytes are like plants that grow on other plants, these orchids are epiphytes. They grow on a tree, but they don't steal nutrients from the tree. They just live on the, the branches of the tree and then rain comes and they collect and store water in leaves that collect around their root system, but they don't harm the plant. Unlike parasitic plants like mistletoe, which steals nutrients from the tree it lives in. So that's a parasitic plant. Daughter plants, another example of a parasite. And then the last example is a unique example of insectivorous plants or carnivorous plants. These are like the Venus flytrap and the sundew plant. These, the plant actually captures insects either on sticky structures or in these little trap like structures and then release enzymes the plant breaks down and then it absorbs it uh, it can have active traps like the venus fly traps or non-active traps like this or a pitcher plant which is a cup structure that the plant uses to catch insects so those are some variations and that's where we're going to end we have our next podcast um, going into plant hormones <music>